Hello, my name is Arkelia Todd and the purpose of this video is to express the importance of a Christian having the mind of Jesus Christ. The content is taken from the book, The Brainwashing of Black America, How God Helped Me Overcome. For a copy of the book or the free workbook, email me at kinsmanredeemer41 at gmail.com. This is a video series detailing each chapter with assessment questions. Feel free to listen to the question and answer it for yourself before continuing on with the lesson. This week we are studying from chapter 8, Captivated Thinking. Question number 1. Why is it important to have the mind of Jesus Christ? Christians are taught to get their thinking in line with that of Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. When people have the mind of Christ, they are able to more effectively handle life situations. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 6. Brainwashing happens when a person accepts someone's false concept as truth. Jesus said no to Peter's idea of what was right. Matthew chapter 16 verses 22 through 24. Eve said yes to the servants. serpent's false belief. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 through 7. Jesus did not buy into the lie. Eve did. We are punished when we act on the lies people send our way. Genesis chapter 3. When we act on a lie, we in essence suppress the truth of God, which is wickedness. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. We err when we believe the lie and act on it instead of living out God's truth. Are you able to say no to false notions that people speak into your life? Or do you accept that these notions as truth, therefore have been brainwashed? Question number one. Why is it important to have the mind of Christ Jesus so that an individual can better navigate life and you don't believe an individual's report when he or she tries to disqualify you for what God has qualified you for. Question number two. What, how do you handle someone's opinion of you? Knowing God's truth allows you to not be brought low by someone's opinion of you. I was at work and a white guy who had been making comments about my natural hair since I started wearing an afro made yet another comment. He said with a little smirk on his face, Arcuria, you are sport sporting a flat top. I put one hand on my hip, the other on my afro and said, Wade, don't be jealous. That's how some people operate. They would have you feel badly about how God made you by making polite put downs. Don't be fooled. Wade was hating. He was hating the fact that I could accept and love myself. I didn't have to look like he thought I should. After my reply, he was through. I didn't care what he thought. Did Wade know better than God? I, Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, King James Version states, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, you were created by God. That fact enables you to be okay with His design. Question number two. How do you handle someone's opinion of you? God made me and He knew what He was doing. Can anyone dispute that? Weigh what an individual states against God's assessment. Question number three. How does scripture teach us to value ourselves? Paul wrote that he was taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. We must take ownership of our thinking processes and make them obedient to Christ, not others. Before God opened my eyes, I would have been offended and possibly even hurt by Wade's comment about my hair. But God showed me where I needed to be aware that I had accepted the thoughts of others as something of value. I had valued what the white guy said more than what God said. I would have allowed myself to be affected by Wade's opinion God asked me, what is Wade's opinion going to do for you? Why does his opinion matter? Are someone else's opinions and comments about you more valuable than mine? Remember, scripture taught me I was created for God's pleasure, 
not my white co-workers. I should certainly listen to the thoughts of others and weigh them, but I should never allow what they say to rule my thoughts. We are to contemplate what is said and the content of what is true, sharpening each other as iron, but remaining autonomous thinkers. God's word should be paramount in our lives. Is God's truth controlling your thoughts? Question number three. How does scripture teach us to value ourselves? Value yourself based on God's opinion, not others. You were created by God for his pleasure, not others. Don't get it twisted and let others know God is okay with you. That's powerful. Question number four. Do you put a racist opinion of you as high regard? God helped me see how I prostituted myself by subjecting my actions to white people's approval. I had gone to Joanne's novelty shop to get material for my sewing class. I was ready to get my fabric cut so I got a number which told the fabric cutter who was next. There were so many customers waiting to get their material cut that one of the cutters requested assistance. The additional help came and asked, who's next? Someone mentioned the number they were holding. A white lady made a comment about not having a number and that a white girl standing there was next and she was after her. Well, I thought about what I should do because I had the next number. And sure, they were there first. Was I supposed to give up my spot for them? How would I glorify God? I asked God what I should do and I heard nothing. So when the store clerk called my number, I proceeded to the counter and got my fabric cut. I didn't say anything, but I thought, this is why Joanne has the number process, so the order will be established and there won't be any confusion. There is already a system in place so people can go and order. As I left, I thought maybe the young girl learned a lesson. Maybe next time she would look for the number dispenser. I hope so anyway. There was a time not too long ago where I valued greatly what people thought of me and would respond in ways that would be pleasing in their sight just like this in last incident. There would have been no way I would have gone with the number system. I would have felt compelled to give the white girl my number or let her go ahead of me. God told me I valued what white people thought more than what he thought, but he was going to help me and teach me how to stop prostituting myself. Question number four. Do you put a racist opinion of you as high regard? Looking toward heaven, God frees you from the opinion of others, which is very powerful. He sets you free from others' ridicule, shame, and confidence-stealing comments. God allows you to be free to be you and okay with yourself. Question number five. Whose sight are you working towards to be pleasing? Numbers chapter 15 verses 37 through 41 teaches, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by going after the lust of your own eyes and hearts. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and you will be consecrated to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. I have been prostituting myself by going after the lust of white people's approval. God was not pleased and because of this misplaced value I was tore up from the floor up. But God, he helped me get control of this wrong way of thinking caused by valuing what others thought which has no lasting value. White people can't save me. Why did I care to be in their good graces? What was their approval going to do for me? Nothing. God said he is the Lord my God. That means no one else is my God. Only him. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. James chapter 1 verses 16 through 18. What can anyone do for me that he cannot? Question number five. How... Whose sight are you working towards to be pleasing? Strive to be approved by God. Question number six. 
How does God teach an individual to discontinue prostituting themselves? Consecrate, it, consecrate yourself to God and obey all his commands. That frees you from prostitution. This way, set up God as Lord in your life and no one else above him. Set yourself apart for God. Question number seven. What is prostituting oneself as recorded in scripture? It is lusting for something in our eyes and instead of demonstrating self-control, we go after what we lust for instead of running after God. Question number eight. Like, how does God teach, okay, so how do people today say, here are your gods who provide and take care of you? What did God show me? After the people in charge want you to worship something other than the true and living God, they want to replace your worship of him and get you to worship something or someone else. 1 Kings chapter 12 verses 26 through 28 teaches, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to the Lord, Rehoboam king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Question number eight. Like Jehoboam, how do people today say, here are your gods who provide and take care of you? They do this when they say, this is a good person. Their desire is to persuade and influence your allegiance. They work to control what you believe. Question number nine. How does today's Jehoboam's work to replace the worship of God in your life with something or someone else? In this scenario, the new king took the Israelites' attention off God and told them to worship some golden calves, which hadn't done a thing for them and couldn't do a thing for them. Some people want to take your attention off God and tell you, who to worship, they tell you, worship the white man. He's the one who makes things happen for you. He's the one in charge of what happens. He's the one who has done all good things for you and yours, not. The Jehoboam's of the world would try to replace the worship of God in your life with something or someone else. Can they? Can a person persuade you to worship who they want you to? My coworker Carrie reminded me of Jehoboam. Carrie would get in my ear and tell me what to think of a person. The people she wanted me to pray, she gave positive remarks. She would say, this person is a good person. This person does a good job. Even though he did such and such, he has a good heart. She would make excuses for the bad deeds of the people she liked, though she wanted to influence my thoughts about. Then she would put, have put downs for others. I realized how she wanted to sway my thinking on what was praiseworthy. She wanted me to see things her way and would work at painting a picture that would color the truth. Carrie, but I was very much aware of her manipulation. I would not allow Carrie to control my thinking. She would mention the misdeeds of certain people and question their Christianity. But there were other people she liked who had done misdeeds as well, and there was no mention of their transgression. Question number nine. How does today's Jeroboam's work to replace the worship of God in your life with something or someone else? They determine to tell you what to think about an individual. Instead, seek the truth and not base your insight on their position only. Question number 10. How do you handle the obvious mistakes you make? Would I let my coworkers' thoughts steal my peace? Once I was training Bill, there was training on the adjacent position as well. Another coworker asked if he could change an aircraft's route of flight. My trainee Bill hesitated and I said approved. 
When we hung up from the co-worker, Bill said, does that clearance you just gave put the two aircraft in confliction with each other? He had a valid point. I had overlooked some air traffic. I felt terrible because I was training someone and making a bad call. I felt terrible because I was supposed to be showing him how to do the job correctly, not making mistakes. I sat there and watched the situation develop because I thought my plan was going to work. The co-worker stopped the departing aircraft's climb to ensure the two aircraft did not get too close to each other. I was embarrassed. I could have and should have handled the situation differently. As I thought about it, I should have told the co-worker that what I had done and asked him to stop the departing aircraft climb or the turn I had given the aircraft. There was nothing wrong with making a mistake. We all do from time to time. I need to own and correct my mistake. That was a huge lesson for me. I had told myself that the turn was going to work and the aircraft would still be separated. Then when the doubt set in, I didn't want to be wrong. Instead of ensuring separation, I just went on with my first thought. I was set on being right. I had to learn there's nothing wrong with making a mistake. Jesus was the only person without sin. Lesson learned. I didn't have to act like I was without fault. Instead, I should have made the things right and not felt condemned about making an error. Question number 10. How do you handle the obvious mistakes you make? Know that the biggest room is the room for improvement. Feel free to state that after a mistake. Question number 11. How do you feel when you make a workplace mistake in front of your coworkers? Am I perfect? Far from it. And as soon as I see myself as imperfect and willing to own my mistakes and ask for forgiveness and make things right, I'll be a liberated sister. My brother Ortega would say, the biggest room is a room for improvement. Thank you, Lord, for another chance and another chance to get things right. After I looked at myself through the eyes of God as a person who makes mistakes but am forever growing, I was able to walk in my area after this incident with my held, head held high and not looking disgraced because of my blunder, even though the guy I was training could have told everybody at my job my mistake. I believe he had mentioned my goof up to several people, but God had shown me how to own and correct my mistakes. I was learning no condemnation. I was not going to condemn myself and I was not going to worry thinking about my co-workers judgment and condemn myself either. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Question number 11. How do you feel when you make a workplace mistake in front of your co-workers? Repeat after me. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I will learn, grow, own and fix my mistakes and apologize and move forward. Question number 12. Should you expect worse workplace drama? By allowing us to suffer insults, conflicts, and other hardships, God teaches us to rely on Him. The supervisor told me, that, told all the con workers to check the freaks. He was referring to the frequencies we use to talk to aircraft. Someone in the department said, we have a lot of freaks in the area. If she was referring to me, I was glad to be considered a freak, which was being labeled differently than those around me which was, I'm sure people considered Jesus a freak in his day. He was different from what the people were accustomed to. What good company to keep. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 10 says, That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses and insults, in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I said to myself, is that all she has? That little insult is nothing. I'm glad to be encounter insults because you see I'm different from you. I could have let her comment bother me, but I was proud of that distinction. You see, with God you are first weak, but then become strong. By yourself you stay weak. Question number 12. Should you expect workplace drama?
connect with God and become strengthened against insults, persecutions, and difficulties. Question number 13. Who or what have you set up as your God? We must know and teach that white people are not the standard. We are not to seek their approval or acceptance. Jesus is the standard. And God's view should rule and guide us in what we do and how we think. We should act and work and be so that God will one day say, This is my child and who I am well pleased. That should be your goal, not what anyone else says or thinks. We are taught that when we set up others as our God, we are out of God's will and we will suffer for such erroneous thinking. Judges chapter 8 verses 33 through 34 ex emphasizes added. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bertha as their God and did not remember the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. If there are false gods in your life, it is because you set them up and it is up to you to remove them. Question 13. Who or what have you set up as your God? Who do you seek help from? Seek help from God. He can help you when no one else can. Set him up as God and Lord in your life. Let him replace all other gods. And he is the ultimate rescuer and provider. He alone can rescue you from the hands of your enemies on every side. Question number 14. Who should we seek help from? How does a person make people and things their gods and put those idols in the place of the true and living God? I'm glad you asked. A person does this by putting their hope, trust, and security in someone or something besides God. They forget who has provided for them and rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Question number 14. Who should you seek help from? There are times when people can't help you or want to help you. But God will help you when those who should, won't. Depend on him. Ask him to help you. Question number 15. Why is it okay to seek help from others, but important to never leave God out? God told me to stop bowing down. Stop looking for the white man's approval. Who was he that I should trust? It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Psalms 118 verse 8. So if I look to someone else to help me and make a way for me instead of the Father, that person becomes my idol. I have then set him or her up in the place of God. But God is the way maker. In the 39th year of the reign, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12. Question number 15. Why is it okay to seek help from others, but important to never leave God out? God can help you when doctors, lawyers, your parents, supervisor, or mate can't. He can help you when you can't even help yourself. Question number 16. How do you hear the Holy Spirit? God helped me deal with my misguided thinking. I began to seek help from his counsel and help with situations. And he would give me answers to the problems I was facing. I had planned to go to South Africa on a two week vacation. Before I left, I noticed all of the dates I needed for my vacation were not selected on the annual leave form at work. In my spirit, I heard to bring the situation with the leave to my supervisor's attention. The old Arcuria was thinking, I'm going on vacation and I will handle this leave situation when I get back because I don't want to get, deal with management giving me any static about not being able to take my vacation. Instead, I did what was right and brought the leave situation to my supervisor's attention. Luke said he would check into whether I had annual leave for the days in question. Chapter 6, verse 16. Question 16. 
How do you hear the Holy Spirit? Listen as God's voice tells you to do the right thing. Allow his voice to direct you over all or other voices. Question number 17. How can management cause you frustrations, but how can God grant peace? A couple of days passed and I didn't hear anything from Luke, so I went to him and said, When you find out something, let me know. He said he would. My trip was about a week away. I was through asking him about the leave after that. I felt I had done everything I could do to resolve the leave issue before my trip. On my last ship before my vacation, I left work without knowing what he had discovered because he had done what he said and gotten back with me. But God gave me peace. I was not worried. I was not going to chase after the answer. I went on vacation. Question number 17. How can management cause you frustrations but God grant peace? God directions will cause you to be in right standing and above reproach where no one can find righteous fault. Then he will give you peace in what is meant to cause frustrations. Question number 18. How does management get an individual to incriminate themselves? On my way home from vacation, I flew into D.C. before flying back to Arlington. I had gotten a phone call from work saying management had expected me at work that Friday, the day in question. I listened to the message and knew I wouldn't be in Arlington until Saturday, so I decided to return the call once I landed in Texas. I ended up calling Luke at home and leaving a message that said after our conversation I felt I was clear to take off since I hadn't heard anything different. When I got to work Luke mentioned he was going to give me an on the spot review of my skills. Now, ma now mind you he hadn't given me one in an entire year but he waited until I had been off work for two weeks to critique my skills. After the session we went to his office to talk about my performance and the situation with the leave dates. I listened. He wanted to know if I had anything to say. I said no. I could sense he was waiting on me to incriminate myself. You see, this was his meeting. I was going to see what he was going to say because he knew he hadn't done what he should. He hadn't even done what he said he would. Plus, I could remind him of everything I had done to find out the truth. What else could a sister do? God had me be quiet and just listen. I didn't need to justify myself just listen question number 18 how does management get an individual to incriminate themselves by talking without being led by the Holy Spirit practice listening practice silence question number 19 has management ever ruined your day what happened and what will you do to prevent that from happening in the future you will never guess what happened, but the man apologized for what he said. He mentioned he had misled me by telling me it was probably management's fault the leave wasn't indicated. He went on to apologize for ruining my weekend with the message he left me on Friday. I told him he had ruined my weekend, I was thinking, like you wanted to. I had planned to show him on the master schedule sheet where I had requested two consecutive weeks off for vacation. He said the master schedule had been misplaced. I thought, how convenient. Question number 19. How has management ever ruined your day? What happened and what will you do to prevent that from happening in the future? Call on God and obey him as he directs you through life's hot spots. Question number 20. Are you aware that some desire to put your mind in a tailspin? From this experience, I saw how people would want to put my mind in a tailspin. My supervisor wanted me to worry about having to take leave without pay because I didn't have the proper leave schedule for my vacation. Luke wanted me to continue to ask him what was going on with the leave situation. Then he wanted to ruin my weekend with the message he left. God let me see this man's intentions and he showed me how to handle Luke's desire to create distress in my life. God gave me peace about everything and discernment that all I had to do was let him work it out. He always does. Now I realized what I was dealing with in my supervisor. He had proven he could not be trusted. 
If I needed to know something, I should not expect him to follow through and get back to me in a timely manner. He was purposeful with withholding information. He would do things to upset me, and it would be up to me to let the things he did upset me or not. Question number 20. Are you aware that some desire to put your mind in a tailspin? God gives insight to those who depend on him. When you see the nature of an individual, do not forget. Remember character so you will be prepared in future instances. Question number 21. How can you know who to trust and who is untrustworthy? God was doing a new thing in me. Those days of me giving away the power over my thinking were coming to an end. One day my ship was over and my relief was in the area. Instead of allowing this person to relieve me from my duties, Luke engaged the guy in conversation which delayed me getting off position. I just sat there patiently waiting for them to finish talking. I knew my supervisor wanted to incite me. I saw his intentions, but I was getting off work. That blessing didn't change. I was going home and he could not ruin my day unless I allowed him to. Remember, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Can you detect when someone wants to steal your joy? Question number 21. How can you know who to trust and who is trustworthy? Can you discern when an individual is working to steal your joy? Do not let the evil spirit steal your joy. That is what it is after. Say no, you cannot have my joy. Question number 22 and the final question. How can you discern when someone is scheming to harm you? God's servant Nehemiah saw the conniving plan those are of those around him. He was not fooled. Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 1 through 3 reads, When word came to Sabiah, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of all our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates Sabiath and Jeshem sent me this message come let us meet together in one of the villages of the plan oh no but they were scheming to harm me so I sent messages to them with this reply I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you like Nehemiah, can you tell when someone is scheming to hurt you? Question number 23 and the final question. How can you discern when someone is scheming to harm you? Stay close to God who reveals the schemers and the schemes. And we will end in prayer. Lord God, Jehovah, help us have the mind of Christ so we all know how to not pers prostitute us by going after the lust of individuals how we will know how to not put others as God in our lives but to listen to your word about others and be okay in who you have created us to be which is very powerful set us apart for your purpose and your will and your desires and not others leading and guiding us by what they think and their opinions help us to be okay with insults and to call on you for help in every way that you can protect us from enemies on every side. Help us to see the schemers and the deceit so we aren't fooled like Christ was not fooled. In Jesus name we pray. God bless you and may you grow in his strength and his likeness every day.